So we're here to talk about how to continuously deploy to Kubernetes with the Google Container Tools. So before I start, I'd like to know who here is using Kubernetes like every day? A few people. Who's using Docker containers? OK. So even if you're not using uh, Kubernetes, you might be interested in what I'm going to show. So uh, before I start, I'm David Gageau. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I'm based out of Paris, France. And I mainly work on things that are related to developer experience. So CLIs for the developers, tools for the developers. And I do love cats. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask them, ask them during the talk, or you can ping me on uh, Twitter or GitHub. Um, it's the same login. So what is it like to be a developer in a Kubernetes world? Do you like that, the ones who? Use it every day? Yeah? Yeah, because for me, it's more like that. It's, OK, this is fine. So many, com so many layers, so much complexity, so many tools. Uh, it looks like there's a new tool like every second that we have to learn. And of course, there will, there will always be sorry the, the next tool that's going to solve all my problems. But when I try it, it doesn't really solve my problems. In fact, at Google, we asked uh, actual users, actual developers, how do they find the experience of developing for Kubernetes? And basically, they all said it was frustrating. They all said that it requires too much configuration, that debugging is a pain. Uh, applications now have so many moving parts that it becomes very complicated to understand what we've deployed. And basically, they want to spend more time on their code and less on the, the tools. For those who don't know, I'm going to show you a little bit what the problem is. Oops, sorry. I'm going to yeah, I'm going to zoom in. Can I zoom in? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to zoom in. Can you all see the screen? If I mean, there's enough room, so you can like come. By me. OK, so I've got a, here I've got a Go application. So it's not Java, it's a Go application, but it's basically the Hello World. It's going to print Hello World every second. Usually, if I want to run it without any container, without Kubernetes, I do something like that. Go run main.go, and boom, I've got Hello World as shown every second. If I want to run it inside a container, I need to write usually a Docker file. So with this Docker file, I can take the sources from my application, I can build a binary out of it, and I can then run this binary. If I had Java sources, I would build, uh, I would compile the sources, and I could run them with a JVM. But here is, it's going, so I'm going to just compile them. So the, the Docker files, it's a recipe to create a Docker container. So basically, you have to do something like um, Docker build. You give it a name, and then you can do Docker run it will give us the same output as the Go run, but this time I can take the Docker image, I can give it to you or you, I can put it in production. It's going to behave the same that on my machine. And then maybe my application grows, and I want to deploy it on Kubernetes. So I need to write an additional file. I need to write a pod YAML description. And this is like the smallest YAML I can write for Kubernetes. If I send it to Kubernetes, it will start what's called a pod. And in that pod, my image will run. It would be the only container to run in that image. And how do I deploy that to my uh, Kubernetes cluster? So first, I, to, I need to make sure that I've got a cluster. I've got a one node cluster. And I need to apply this YAML. And Kubernetes says to me, OK, it's created. I don't know if it's running. I don't know if it's failing or not. It's created. So I can like, really see that it is running, and I can I can take a look at the logs. Oops, sorry. Uh, oh, OK. I can take a look at the logs, OK? Hello, world. So basically, it was quite easy to take my application, containerize it, and deploy it to Kubernetes. But now I'm a developer, so I need to change my application. I'm going to change it, and I'm going to say, OK, uh, hello, Barcelona. So what do I have to do then? I have to rebuild the Docker image. I'm going to do that. I'm going to give it a new tag, because it's a new version. 
it's going to rebuild my Docker image. So I need to change my YAML file to redeploy my application. So I'm going to switch V1 to V2. And I'm going to apply that again. Oops. And I'm going to see the logs again. Yeah, it worked. But like, it's a lot of commands, OK? A lot of patching everywhere. This is what I call the infinite loop of pain and suffering. Okay, you're gonna do you're gonna do that every day. You're gonna do something similar every day because the more you're using Kubernetes, the more you will want to deploy to Kubernetes because Kubernetes is going to give you more features. It's going to be extended. It's going to carry all the authentication or load balancing or things like that, service discovery. And as soon as you use Kubernetes, you will want to deploy more and more often to it, and so you will get into this loop of pain and suffering. So usually people try to solve that with custom bash script or make files, but if you change to a different team, you have to learn all the tools again. It's really, there's place for lots of errors here. And this is Hello World. So if you have like 20 microservices, how do you deal with the complexity? So this is where the first tool uh, is going to be, this first tool is going to be useful. This tool is Scaffold. Who knows Scaffold? Nobody? Cool. So you're going to discover Scaffold. So Scaffold is a CLI tool. Uh, it's open source. You can find it on GitHub uh, in the Google Container Tools uh, organization. And basically, it gives you very iterative, very fast iterative development for Kubernetes. It works. Uh, if you have a local cluster or remote cluster, it doesn't matter. It works with any Kubernetes cluster. It could be on-prem, cloud, it could be Minikube, Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, OpenShift, whatever. It works with any Kubernetes. So I'm going to show you how to use it. Basically, we're going to start in a folder with the same sources as before. And first, I need to write an additional YAML file. I'm sorry. You're going to have to love YAML files, okay? You're going to have to learn to love YAML files. If you don't like them, I'm sorry. Uh, with Scaffold, you could write this YAML file or you could ask Scaffold to try to find out the best configuration. So I'm going to use Scaffold in it. And Scaffold will look at all my sources, will look at all the Kubernetes manifest, all the Docker files, and try to match them together. So it gives me this configuration here. This is YAML and says, okay, I discovered only one Docker file, so maybe you have only one artifact, and I discovered only one YAML file. So I think the YAML file is using the image that you're building with Docker file. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So now I've got a scaffold.yaml, and I can do things like scaffold build. Not very impressive. It's just that under the hood, what it's going to do is it's going to rebuild your Docker image, or maybe your Docker images, like if you have multiple services, and it's going to find a tag automatically. You don't have to think about the tag yourself. It's going to use my git commits or git tags to tag my images automatically. But that's not really useful. I mean, not, not super nice. So you can do something better, like scaffold run. Scaffold run will build your image, will tag your image, will take the tag, put it into the YAML, send the YAML to Kubernetes, and make sure it's deployed. So that's quite good. But you can do better than that. You can do scaffold run dash dash tail. And now you've got the full circle. You've got the application built, tagged, deployed, and you see the logs. So you've got very quick feedback on what you've actually deployed. But we can do even better than that. Because we're developers, we have a mode for developers, which is scaffold dev. Scaffold dev deploys your application, but also watches for all the changes to your sources. So that if I open a new tab and I change the sources and I save, it's going to detect the change. It's going to rebuild, retag, patch the YAML, send it to Kubernetes, and listen for the logs. Okay, so I can just focus on my development cycle. I don't have to think about. It. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so you want to try it on Monday, right? Yeah. Okay. So we can do better than that, but that's, that's good enough. Uh, if I control C, it's going to delete everything, make sure that my cluster is clean, so I can like, come later for, an uh, for more work. OK, so that, that's quite good. Uh, but there's a problem. 
there's a problem because very often building Docker images can be very slow. In my sample, I make a small change and it takes one second to build a Docker image. In reality, if you have like a Java application, it takes more time to build a Docker image, right? How long does it take to build your Docker images? Like 30 seconds, one minute, yeah? Okay, so you change something, one minute, five minutes, and then you wait until it's deployed. So it's not really like perfect and you cannot use scaffold dev with that kind of Docker image. So I'm gonna show you, first I'm gonna show you why it's slow and then I'm gonna show you a solution. Uh, here this is a, a Spring Boot, sorry, Spring Boot Java application. So it's the hello world of Spring Boot, so it's just saying hello world, and I've got a POM XML, like the smallest possible, and I've got a Docker file. And so if I Docker build my application, if I Docker build my application, um, oh, no, Docker build, sorry. I'm gonna try that again. Okay, I'm gonna say, um, I'm gonna call it like boot. It's quite quick, okay? Because I built it already on my machine, so it's very quick. It was built already with the same sources. What if I change something in the POM XML? Like I'm gonna add a exclamation mark here, okay? How long do you think it's gonna to take to rebuild my Docker image? 10 seconds? One minute? Four minutes? 10 minutes? Okay, in fact, it depends on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> depends on the Wi-Fi because it's gonna download all the dependencies for my applications, all the Maven plugins again, as if it has never downloaded them already. Like, it can take a lot of time. Usually on my machine, it's like four minutes. Why, why do we have this problem? This problem is very linked to the way Docker build is, wor is, is working. So Docker build, it's a list of actions, and for each action, if the result, if the inputs are the same, we can assume that the output will be the same. It's not always true, but Docker will think it's always true. So if I've got the same POM YAML, I assume that I can just go to the next uh, step and take it from the cache. So it's not going to download all the plugins. But if I change something in the POM YAML, even if it, does, if, it, if it has no impact on my application, I'm gonna have to download all the plugins again. And then I'm gonna have to recompile the application as if I've never seen those sources, okay? So basically with Docker build, there's nothing you can do about that. Like there's layers, there's caching, but as soon as you change something, the layers then have to be recomputed. So if it involves downloading things, it's gonna redownload things. Okay, so I don't know how long it took, maybe two, three minutes, but that's quite long and scaffold dev would not be very nice with that. Okay, so I'm gonna show you another tool you can use to build your Docker images much quicker. It's Jib, who knows Jib here? A few people, okay. For those who don't know, Jib is, stands for Java Image Builder. It's a Maven or Gradle plugin that you can use to build Docker images for your Java applications, or in fact, for any JVM application that can be built with Maven and Gradle. Uh, there's one thing that's very nice, is that it's gonna build Docker images without requiring Docker. So you don't have to install Docker on your machine. Also, you don't have to write a Docker file. It will just understand your application from the sources, from Maven, from Gradle, and it's gonna put the application inside a Docker image. Let me show that to you, how it works. So it's the same Spring Boot, Spring Boot application. Uh, Spring Boot ab application here, hello world. I've got a POM XML. I don't have any Docker file because I don't need to write a Docker file. It's just that I added this configuration here, I added the Jib Maven plugin to my POM XML. And now I can do something like Maven compile Jib build. I can run this target and give it an image name. And Jib will compile the application with Maven, create Docker images out of it, and push the Docker image. Five seconds. 
what if I change the, the description in the Pomiamo and I rebuild? It should take about five seconds too. Four seconds, okay? So if you use Jib, you can really have this tight feedback loop with scaffold. So if you combine Jib and scaffold like that, you can have something like you do scaffold dev. It's going to build your Java application, and it's going to deploy it. And you're going to have your tight feedback loop. OK? That's cool, right? Who wants to try Jib? Only you? Ah, more. You should, try. you should try it. Like, if you have any Java application or JVM application that builds a Docker image, you should really give it a try. Because it's much easier. It gives you faster build. It gives you better layouts in your Docker images so that the images are faster to push, faster to pull. And the biggest interest is that you don't have to think about it. You just add Jib Maven plugin, that's it, you're done. It works also with Gradle. I'm not going to show that, but it works the same. I just have to declare the Jib plugin in Gradle. OK, so one thing I want to show is that if you take Jib and Scaffold and combine them together on something that is not a Hello World, it works great too. So here, I've got a Scaffold YAML with multiple artifacts. Each of them will create a Docker image. Each of them has their sources in a different folder. Some of those artifacts are built with Jib, Gradle. Some of them are um, Go, application, uh, Go uh, services. Some of them are Java services, Node.js. So it's like a typical real-world application, right? So I can some, do something like scaffold dev. It's going to rebuild all my images. It's going to tag them, change the YAML, and it sends for all the logs. Will it work? Yeah. See? I have like the, the mix of all the logs for all the microservices. Ooh, it works. So I can see the logs. If I use my application, I see the logs. That's quite nice, right? And because this is scaffold dev, I can change the sources. I can do something like I'm going to change. Uh, so this is a vertex. Java application built with Jib, and it says Google Cloud Quiz. I'm going to do something like Barcelona, oops, Barcelona Quiz. I can just save it, and Scaffold will detect the change, rebuild the Docker image, and redeploy only that component. So that now, if I refresh, if I refresh, I should see, <laughs> or not. <laughs> Yeah, Barcelona quiz, OK? That's quite quick, right? I can do it even better. Like, if I'm changing not a, a Java file, but a, a static file, a static file somewhere like here, I'm going to add some more exclamation marks. I'm going to, oops, I'm going to save. And boom, it's even quicker. Because this time, it didn't have to rebuild the Docker image. It's just detected the change locally on my machine, took the file, it sent it to the pod inside the container, and that's it. So don't do that in production, but for development, it's very useful. I'm going to do that again. I'm going to edit. Just save. Oh. <laughs> save. And you can see that scaffold synced the file to the server. So that's very, very quick, very tight feedback loop. And what if I'm not, like, for this demo, I'm, I'm using Docker, Docker for Mac. Who knows Docker for Mac, Docker Desktop? OK, if you don't know, Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows is the easiest way to install Docker on your machine. And what's very nice is that with a single click, you can have Kubernetes running on your machine. So this is what I use for my demo. It's a single node cluster that I can use for my demo. The problem is, if my application grows, it's not going to be big enough it's not going to be able to run all the services. So maybe I want to work with a remote cluster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to a different cluster. So just to show you, it has more than one node. 
It's running on Google Cloud. It has three nodes. And I'm going to run the exact same command, scaffold f. And I should see the exact same application running, not on my machine, but on a remote cluster. Ooh, <laughs> no. OK. Um, what did I do? OK, if it doesn't work, you're going to have to trust me. Yeah, you're going to have to trust me. I, so I'm a maintainer on scaffold, so I broke something this morning. So here it is. It's broken. But it will be basically the same. So it would start the application. In fact, I've got, a, I've got an image to show you. So it would start the application on the remote cluster and make sure that all the ports are forwarded to my local machine so that I can connect on local host. This is very convenient. I don't have to know where the cluster is. I can just connect on local host, and I, and I use my application. And if I change something, it's going to either sync the file to the remote cluster or it's going to re-trigger a Maven build or a Gradle build or a Docker build and make sure that all the components are updated on my cluster. Nice, right? So this is how you get very tight feedback loop with continuous deployment to Kubernetes as a developer. Who wants to try that? Yeah, two people? Cool. So that's Scaffold. It gives you a tight feedback loop. The idea of Scaffold is that it adapts to your tooling. So Maybe you prefer Jeep, or maybe you prefer Docker Build, or maybe you prefer Bazel. It can use any of those. Um, maybe you, you like uh, to run Kubernetes on the cloud, or on-prem, or locally. It works with all of them. Maybe you want to deploy with kubectl, or you want to deploy with Helm, or you want to deploy with Customize. It supports all three ways of uh, deploying applications. So you come with your toolings. And we try to adapt with Scaffold so that you don't have to learn more tools. You just code, and it deploys. OK, but could it be easier? Like, it was complicated. I had to type Scaffold dev, and I, write, I had to write a Scaffold YAML. So it could be easier. It could be easier because a few months ago, we introduced Cloud Code. Who knows Cloud Code? No? So Cloud Code is a set of extensions for uh, VS Code or IntelliJ that you can use to deploy your applications to Kubernetes. And you have basically the same experience that you have with Scaffold and Jib, but inside your IDE, if your IDE is VS Code or JetBrains. By the way, who, use, who uses VS Code here? No. IntelliJ, JetBrains, OK. Eclipse, a few Eclipse users, OK. So as long as you're not using Eclipse, you're good with Cloud Code, sorry. So I'm going to show you Cloud Code for VS Code. This is the one I'm using. I'm mainly a Go developer now, so I use uh, VS Code all the time. Um, I'm going to do something like that. I'm going to open um, VS Code. OK, so this is my Hexagons uh, project. And you can see here that I've got a, a Kubernetes Explorer extension that I can use to explore my different clusters. I can switch to a remote cluster, or I can switch back to the local cluster. I can take a look at the, what's, what's deployed, the services, etc. I'm going to switch back to this one. So I should have something already deployed, like, or maybe not, because I deleted it. OK. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use Cloud Code, Cloud Code, Continuous Deploy. Can you read it? Like, Continuous Deploy. So I'm going to deploy the default profile, and I'm going to deploy it to Docker Desktop. So basically, it's going to use Scaffold underneath. And it's going to redeploy my application on my cluster. Oops. Localhost 8080. Or maybe not. Yeah, Barcelona quiz. It's a bit, yeah. OK? See? So I didn't have to think about scaffold dev. I'm just using my IDE. And if I change something, uh, like I'm changing the UI, it's going to be the same, same experience. Like I'm going to add some more. Boom. It's deployed, OK? So you can just focus on your code, and you can have the same thing as scaffold, but inside your IDE. 
And Cloud Code can do much more than that. Cloud Code can help you get started with Kubernetes. If you don't know Kubernetes, we can help you get started by creating new applications. Like it gives you lots of templates that you can start from to learn the syntax of the manifest and things like that. Uh, you also have um, uh, the full documentation for all your YAML files. So you have tooltips. Uh, okay, so I've got two extensions. I've got the, the Cloud Code extension and another one, so all the tooltips are doubled. But yeah, not my fault. It's the way Visual Studio Code works. If you have two extensions providing the same features, you get, you get it in double, okay? So we have like things like uh, validation. Uh, it tells you that the port should be an integer, things like that. So it's very, very super, super convenient. If you want to get started with Kubernetes, or if you're an advanced user, you should really take a look at Cloud Code. So as I said, uh, Studio Code, uh, VS Code, or IntelliJ, you can find them in, in the marketplace. Okay, let's get back to how we build Docker images. So for those of you who use Kubernetes, or for those of you who, who just use Docker, you might know that building Docker images is very hard, right? You end up with like very big Docker images with lots of layers, and it's very long to push, very long to pull. You don't even know which base image to, to choose. It can be very complicated. I, would, I always joke, by, I always say that in every company, there's a team dedicated to finding the best Docker images, the base images, and they usually like take six months to define a short list of base images you can use. None of them you like, but you have to use them, okay? So that's, that's life. Uh, one thing you can do to produce bo better Docker images is you might know multi-stage builds. Who knows multi-stage builds here? Okay, for those of you who use Docker every day, and I've written a Docker file already, you should really take a look at that. So multi-stage build comes from Docker. It's been there for years, and it's a very convenient way to build smaller images and to build images that are like lighter in production, but that give you a lot of flexibility uh, for building your application. So here's how it works. So you've got your sources on your machine. We're gonna have one step in the Docker file to build the binary out of the sources, and we're gonna have a second step that is used only to run your application. So you, we have like a build phase and a run phase. At the build phase, you can use, you can use any Docker base image you want. Like it can contain a lot of tools. It can be very heavy. It doesn't matter because this, the tools that are in this base image won't be shipped to production. Because for production, we're gonna use a smaller image, okay? The idea is that this first step will get the sources, create a binary, and then this binary will be copied in the second step. And the second step is the one we're gonna push and deploy to production. Is that clear? Yeah? So here, you can choose any base image. It doesn't matter because it's not the one it was gonna run on in production. And this one might be the base image that you were for forced to use. So if you had like a Java application, you would use this phase to take the sources and create all your jars and wars and archives. And then you copy them to the second step where you have, you've got a runtime environment to run your application, okay? So this is very convenient. And it gives you more flexibility to choose base images here or base images there. One type of base image you could use is distroless. Who knows distroless? Someone knows all the tools, okay? Cool, I've got nothing to win, okay? So, it doesn't matter. Uh, so, if you don't know Distroless, this is a set of minimal base images. Minimal doesn't mean very small, it means that there's no thing in that Docker images that won't be needed to run in production. Like, for example, in production, you don't need a shell, so we removed the shell. You don't need curl or a package manager, so we removed all of them, so that the image is both small and minimalistic, okay? So this way, the image is more secure. It contains a smaller surface FADAC, so you can just take your image, uh, your, your, your application, and copy it on top of a distorted image, and it's gonna create a smaller, more secure image. 
So we have only a, a small set of base images in Distroless. So we have images for compiled languages. We have images for Java. We have images for Python. I think we have some for, some for Node. And I think it's basically it. So it's not the kind of base image you will use for all your images. But if you're doing one of those languages, you might want to take a look. I'm going to show you one example of how to use it with a Go language and one example on how to use it with a Java application. So this is the name of the image, gcrio slash slash base. You can pull it with a like, docker pool with the proper syntax. So I'm going to copy paste that. So anybody can pull that, OK? It's a base image. And it contains only the libc, a few libraries to do SSL, and that's it. There's no shell. There's no package manager. There's no things that you won't need in, uh, in production. So how do you switch from a traditional base image to a distroless? It's very simple. Let me show you my Docker file for a Go application. So it's a multi-stage build. I'm using the Golang base image to build my binary, and I'm using an Alpine to run. So I'm going to just change that and replace it with GCRIO distroless base. And, and that's it. Like a run. Yeah, I've got my hello world. It was very simple, right? Because I've got a multi-stage build, I can choose a different image for the run and for the build. So I've got lots of flexibility. And for Java application, it's basically the same. It's just the base image plus the JVM, OK? So for example, here, this is Java 11. I'm going to change the Docker file. So this time, it's the same. OK, so this one, I'm going to just replace that with this or less. Up. I'm going to Docker build, Docker run, and boom, I've got a Spring Boot application starting. OK? Very simple. So you should really give it a try. It creates more secure images that are a bit smaller. And if you matter, if security matters to you, you should really take a look. Uh, by the way, we've got a, a flavor with a shell if you really want to debug your applications. Because sometimes in, in development, we deploy an application, and there's a bug, and we would like to connect to the container, and we need a shell. And this OS doesn't have any shell. So you can use the column debug flavor of the base image to, to get a shell. OK? OK. One more thing I want to show you is how you can build your Docker images on a cluster. So here, who here is using Jenkins? GitLab? Yeah. OK. So I'm sure you use it to build your Docker images, too. And someone had to set up this CI-CD system. It was quite complicated. And also, they had to choose between binding the Docker socket or running Docker in Docker. For those who don't know what it is, you don't have to care. It's just two options. None of them is good. None of them is secure. None of them is fast. Cool. So they had to choose between the two. And this is basically what happens if you try to build Docker images on a cluster. You have to install Docker on every node. And you have to choose if you're going to bind the Docker socket or run Docker in Docker. And maybe in the future, your cluster is going to run on Kubernetes. And underneath, it won't be Docker. It would be something like <coughs> ContainerD or something else. And you won't be able to bind the Docker socket. So how do you, in the future, do to build your Docker images? You can use a tool called Canico. Who knows Canico here? Nobody? Cool. I like when nobody knows my, ah, you don't know the tool. You don't know. You lost. Sorry, I had something to win. You lost. Oh, I was kidding. So I like when nobody knows the tool, because now you can discover them. So Canico is a very simple tool that basically does the same thing as Docker build without Docker. It runs inside a container. It doesn't have to be a container running on Docker. It can be a container running on any container runtime. Maybe you, don't, maybe you don't care. And Canico will take a Docker file, will take your sources, and will create a Docker image. So it's the same as Docker build. It's just that 
it doesn't come with all the constraints that Docker build has. You don't have to connect to a Docker socket. And Canico will automatically push your image to registry. What is nice with Canico is that you can run it on Kubernetes. You don't have to install anything on your cluster. You can just talk to your cluster with Canico and Scaffold, and it can build your images on a cluster. Like if you have tons of images to build, they're going to build on different nodes in parallel, and it's very quick. Let me show that to you. So here I've got a scaffold YAML. I've got a, my image, and I'm going to ask scaffold to use Canico instead of Docker build to, use my, to, to build my Docker image. Okay? But I still have a Docker file. I still have the sources. The sources are here. Uh, here, there's only one source. Okay? And I can do something like scaffold build. And this time, it's going to use Canico to build my Docker image. So it's going to be a bit longer because it's ha it has to take my sources, create an archive, send it to a Kubernetes cluster, make sure that there's a pod somewhere running Canico. Canico will take the sources, will take the Docker file, and will build a Docker image out of it. And of course, it's failing, or it's so slow. What's going on? It should be quicker than that, usually. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch to a different cluster. It's going to be better, maybe. Scaffold build. So this time, I'm using a remote cluster on the cloud. I'm going to send my sources, send my Docker file, and it should build or not. OK, I'm not lucky today. Yes, it builds. OK. So it's going to do basically the same thing as Docker build. It's going to take more time, but it's going to produce a Docker image at the end. And if for one image it's uh, slower, but if you build a lot of images, or if you share the cluster between a lot of developers, it can be much faster at the end. OK? So only a few seconds. I'm not going to wait, but it should be done very quickly. So that's Canico. Maybe you will never install Canico. Maybe you will never use Canico. But maybe you're going to use tools like Jenkins X. Who knows Jenkins X? Yeah? I've been told that I'm supposed to say Jen Jenkins X now. I don't know. They're like, OK. So Jenkins, in the future, is going to be able to build on a Kubernetes cluster with Jenkins X, and it's going to use Kadiko underneath to build all your Docker images. So maybe you will not know that it's using Kadiko, but you will use it anyways. Or maybe you're going to run your builds on Google Cloud Build, and it's going to use Kadiko underneath. So you can try it, or you can just ignore it, and sometimes in the future, you might I uh, use it without knowing. OK, so now we've done with development. We built our images on a cluster with Canico, and we, we, want, we want to deploy that to production. OK, so here comes another problem, the configuration hell. Who knows configuration hell with Kubernetes? Yeah, a few people. So basically, you have to write something like that. For those who don't know, this is YAML with Go template merged together. So it's YAML with a templating language. And it gives you that. It's so, so good. So nice. You can have loops and tests and variables. It's really nice, right? Very easy to read. Very easy to read, of course. Very easy to maintain, of course, too. Yeah. So. This is a sample taken from, I think it's Istio, but it's a configuration of Helm. Who knows Helm? Do you use Helm for, to deploy to production, or who uses Helm to deploy to production? No? OK. So one of the reasons you might not use Helm is because the name is very close to Hell. OK? Because very quickly, it becomes Hell, because you have to configure your YAML files with templates and it becomes very, very uh, complicated to maintain. If you don't want to use Helm, you have the choice between more than 60 other tools, because that's the way it works in the Kubernetes world. You have 60 different tools that do basically the same. Configuration management to specialize your YAML for a given deployment platform. This is what it does. It takes your YAML, and it will specialize them for a given platform. You've got the choice between more than 60 tools. And the 60, it was like six months ago. So maybe you have now 70 tools, or maybe 80. So that's cool. I'm sure you have a lot of time to try all of them. 
one tool you can use out of this 80 is customize. Who knows customize? Yeah. Do you use customize? No? <laughs> so somebody knew, know is, knows it. So customize is a different way of specializing your YAML files for a given environment. It doesn't rely on templates. There's no new language to learn. It's all YAML, plain YAML, OK? You take your YAML files, and you're going to specialize them with what we call patches and overlays. I'm going to show that to you. It gives you something that's very easy to learn, quite easy to maintain, and it's very easy to distribute and share your YAML files. Uh, it's much easier than with templating engine. Let's say you've got this kind of YAML file. So it's, I'm going to call it my base file. It's the one I used in development, OK? And in production, I want to patch world. I want to replace it with production, OK? I want to change a variable, something in production. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write, write a patch file. A patch file is basically the path to the thing I want to patch. So to make sure that I can patch production, I need to give all the parents till the top. OK? This is a patch file. Of course, you can remove the empty lines. You should remove the empty lines, OK? And if I take the base and the patch and use customize, it's going to produce a file like this one. So it's basically like templating engine, but without any templates. It's just plain YAML. And I can have one patch that patches a lot of files, a lot of things, or I can have uh, lots of patches that patch only small details, and I can combine those two approaches. It's very nice, very easy to write, very easy to maintain. Let me show you how it works. I'm going to switch back to a local cluster. So here I've got a, my base YAML. Okay, it's the same I show in the previous step. Here I've got a customization.yaml. It just says customize, OK, my base setup, so base here, my base setup is to use only this file. But for production, I've got another customization.yaml. It's using, it's generating from base, but it's going to apply some changes. First, it's going to apply some patches. OK, so I've got two patches. I've got one here to change this world. And I've got one here to change the image pool policy, OK? So I've gonna, I can have as many patches as I want. And what else can I do? I can also change the namespace. For example, in production, I might want to run everything in a different namespace. So with Helm, I would have to patch all the namespaces in all the YAMLs, put a variable, and then provide a value for that variable. Here, I just have to put the new namespace here, it's, it's going to change all my YAML files. And it can also add some key value labels to all my objects. Let's say in production, I need to put of prod to all my objects. Customize can do it for me. I don't have to change my base YAML. I just define the overridden values here, namespace, labels, patches. So if I use the customize CLI and give it the folder that contains this customization is going to give me the merge YAML. OK? So this is the merge YAML. You can see that it has like labels. It has a namespace now. It has a new image pool policy. It has this variable was patched. OK? I can give it like, for example, the, um, the base. So this is the base image. And the prod image, this is this one. So very easy to produce one or the other. And I can even combine them with scaffold. I can do something like, uh, is it the next example? Yeah. In scaffold, what I've said is, when you deploy, you use the base, base deployment. But if my cluster is not Docker for desktop, you're going to switch to the prod configuration. Let me show that to you. I'm going to do something like scaffold run in development. It's going to say, hello world, maybe. I hope so. Yeah, hello world. And if I switch to uh, 
production cluster and I do scuffle run dash dash tail, it's going to use the patched version with customize and it's going to deploy that to a remote cluster and it's going to say hello production. And all the pods, all the objects will have additional labels and will run in a different namespace. Yeah, hello production. Okay, cool. So really, if you want to escape the YAML hell, you can start by using uh, customize. Customize is integrated in the new kubectl uh, 1.14. So you don't even have to install customize on your machine because it's integrated now in kubectl. So it will become the standard for small, uh, easy deployments, easy uh, customization for environments. It's GitOps friendly, which means that you can store all those YAMLs and patches and overlays to your GitHub repo and send it to a, a GitOps boat that's going to redeploy everything on each PR. And you can use customize and scaffold each time you make a PR. So it's really easy to use with scaffold. Who wants to try customize? Yeah? In fact, I've seen a lot of people use it for different things like just patching YAML files. Sometimes you don't want to patch uh, uh, for production, but you want to patch for uh, other reasons, and it's quite, quite easy to use. So that's basically what I, uh, everything I had to say. So let's do a quick recap. If you want to take a picture, so basically we showed how customize can be used to handle the customization for different environments. So it basically keeps you out of the YAML hell. Uh, you can use Canico to build images on a Kubernetes cluster, so you don't have to set up anything. You just have a uh, Kubernetes cluster. You use Canico, and you can build your Docker images on it. We've seen how to use Jib to build your JVM applications without installing Docker, without writing a Docker file. It's very easy, and it gives you very quick uh, uh, incrementable, incremental sorry, builds. We've seen how to use uh, DigitalS to uh, give you more secure images, so it's a set of base images you can use. We've seen Cloud Code that gives you a tight feedback loop inside your favorite IDE, if your IDE is VS Code or IntelliJ. And we've seen Scaffold that basically connects all the dots between all those tools. And if there's one tool you should really try, is Scaffold. That's it. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer your questions. And if we don't have time, you can ping me or send me an email. Um, yeah. That's it. Uh, I want to ask you how well do these tools uh, behave with uh, non Google um, cloud providers? So all the tools, let me make sure what I say is correct, yeah. All the tools I showed you work with any cube cluster, like whether it's on-prem, whether it's on the cloud, any cloud provider. Uh, it could be OpenShift, it could be Minikube, it could be Docker Desktop, AWS, Azure, it doesn't matter. All of them, they use the standard API uh, from Kubernetes, so it doesn't matter. It's really important for us. Like all the tools I showed you, we make, sh we make sure that they work with any cloud provider. All right, thank you. More questions? No? So who's gonna try Scaffold on Monday? Jib on Monday? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>